The history is the essential starting place for diagnosis and assessment. On its own, it usually provides the diagnosis or a limited differential. It also gives key information that can only be gained by inquiry. For example, the impact of the condition on the individual. The musculoskeletal system is anatomically complex and there is no need or time to comprehensively examine every region. The history determines what you do in the examination. It directs you to the sites of abnormality and enables you to select from a repertoire of examination skills that are relevant to the individual case. When you come to examine the patient, you should know what you're looking for, not hoping that something will appear from an unfocused appraisal. If you are surprised by examination findings, it usually means the history was inadequate. Presenting symptoms have to be considered in the context of the whole person, taking into account key features such as age, gender, cultural background, occupational and recreational history, past medical record and family history. Again, much of this important information is gained by patient inquiry. For musculoskeletal symptoms, it is important to determine the site and distribution of involvement. For example, are one or several regions affected? Are symptoms predominantly proximal or distal? Are they symmetrical or asymmetrical? The chronological onset and course, for example, gout commonly causes acute recurring episodes with no symptoms between, whereas rheumatoid arthritis is commonly persistent and progressive with additive involvement of joints. Any preceding provoking factors such as injury Factors that worsen or improve symptoms, including any treatments tried, and the severity and impact of symptoms on the person. Pain is the commonest and often the main presenting symptom. And what kind of pain is it? It's, it's really, really bad, really. Excellent. You need to be sure of the exact site of pain experience. Patient terms, such as shoulder or hip, may be misleading. So always ask the patient to point to the site of maximum intensity and to map out the area over which any pain is experienced. Joint or periarticular pain may radiate widely and present maximally at a site distant from the originating structure. Such referred pain in general arises from axial and proximal structures, such as the spine, shoulder and hip, more than distal structures. The pain mainly travels distally rather than proximally, is often diffuse and poorly localised, and may be improved by rubbing. The words the patient uses to characterise their pain are sometimes helpful diagnostically. For example, acute onset of extreme joint pain and tenderness that reaches its maximum within just 6 to 24 hours is very characteristic of crystal synovitis. Sharp shooting pain that travels a long way down a limb is typical of nerve root entrapment and accompanying sensory symptoms of numbness or tingling often confirm its neurogenic origin. It is very helpful to categorise musculoskeletal pain according to its timing in relation to activity. Pain that is worse with movement or use and relieved by rest is characteristic of a mechanical problem such as joint damage or a periarticular strain injury. Joint pain at rest which improves with continued use suggests an inflammatory component. Persistent night pain unrelated to posture or movement is sometimes called bony pain. It reflects raised intraosseous pressure. Although most commonly due to severe joint damage, it can be caused by serious bone disease, 
such as metastatic or primary malignancy and needs full evaluation. Pain during the night that varies according to movement or position in bed is unlikely to be bony and more often originates in joints or periarticular structures. Neurogenic pain with sensory disturbance is typically worse in the early morning. Stiffness or tightness is a subjective feeling of inability to freely move. It often reflects fluid distension of a joint, bursa or tenosynovium. It is most marked on getting up in the morning or following inactivity. As normal usage resumes, increased lymphatic clearance of fluid allows the stiffness to wear off. The duration and severity of early morning and inactivity stiffness indicate the degree of inflammation. For example, it typically lasts only a few minutes in osteoarthritis, several hours in active rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis. Weakness is the subjective reduction in power affecting activities. It is important to differentiate true localised, regional or generalised muscle weakness from the less specific symptom of feeling generally weak but meaning fatigability. Muscle weakness is a key symptom of muscle or nerve disease but may also be secondary to a wide variety of other problems including regional pain, arthritis and metabolic abnormality. The patient may describe swelling, altered colour or abnormal contour or alignment of a locomotor structure. Determine by inquiry whether the swelling is visible or palpable, localised or diffuse. The patient may describe a sensation of swelling that is not confirmed by inspection. Colour change includes redness or unusual pallor. And the patient may have noticed either increased warmth of an inflamed structure or reduced temperature. An abnormality such as bursitis or an arthritic knee can impair function and this may or may not limit normal activity such as walking. Activity limitation may or may not then impact on the person's ability to participate in social, occupational and other events that contribute to their quality of life. Limitation of activities and restriction of participation can only be assessed by patient inquiry. There may be discordance between impairment of function and activities or participation. For example, an above-the-knee amputee may not be disadvantaged in a sedentary job, but a professional athlete may be greatly restricted by a ligament strain. Inflammatory musculoskeletal diseases may trigger the acute phase response and result in non-specific symptoms of systemic upset having night sweats or feeling feverish, feeling tired and easily fatigued, unexplained weight loss, feeling low and irritable, or feeling ill. In elderly or infirm patients, marked acute inflammation such as crystal synovitis may cause a confusional state Several factors related to musculoskeletal conditions may interfere with normal sleep and associate with anxiety, low mood and depression. For example, severe or persistent pain may disrupt sleep. Triggering of the acute phase response and neuroendocrine dysregulation. Reasonable anxiety about the disease and its consequences drug-related CNS effects, for example, opioids and indomethacin, and contribute to disharmony with a partner. Notably, a poor sleep pattern with increased latency, frequent wakening during the night and non-restoration in the morning is a central feature of fibromyalgia.
a wide variety of symptoms in other systems can associate directly or indirectly with musculoskeletal conditions. For example, numbness and tingling from peripheral nerve or root entrapment, Raynaud's phenomenon, especially late onset, associated with connective tissue disease, skin, hair and nail abnormalities such as psoriasis or rashes resulting from vasculitis or lupus, painful red eye due to anterior uveitis associated with seronegative spondarthropathy, dry eyes and mouth due to Sjögren's syndrome. The usual order of examination for most regions is look, feel, move. Specifically, inspect at rest. Inspect during movement. Palpate at rest. Palpate with movement. Detection of an abnormality may be helped by comparing both sides of the body. Five general aspects to observe are attitude, skin changes, swelling, deformity, muscle wasting. Observe the way the patient positions their affected region. A joint with synovitis has intra-articular hypertension and is most comfortable in the position that minimises the pressure increase. This position, generally mild to mid-flexion, is mainly determined by the tightness of the capsule and is termed the loose-pack position, in which the capsule is normally at its loosest and therefore can accommodate fluid increase. Conversely, the position in which the capsule is naturally tight the tight pack position at the extremes of range of movement are the positions that are the first to be painful when synovitis is developing and the first movements to become restricted. For example, glenohumeral synovitis is most comfortable with the arm adducted and internally rotated as if in a sling. Conversely, the opposite movements, abduction and external rotation, are the earliest affected and most uncomfortable since these maximise intra-articular hypertension. The attitude and pattern of restricted movement may thus suggest the underlying problem. Overlying scars or signs of recent trauma may be important clues to causation. A red-hot joint or bursa always raise suspicion of sepsis or crystals. Skin manifestations away from the affected site, for example psoriasis, rashes or nail changes, may also be relevant to the diagnosis. Swelling may be due to fluid, soft tissue or firm material such as bone. Fluid within a joint collects initially and maximally at sites of least resistance within the capsular confines, producing characteristic capsular swelling at individual sites, typically at the extensor aspect. For example, knee effusions fill the medial dimple and subsequently the suprapatellar pouch, giving a horseshoe swelling above and around the patella. Interphalangeal joint synovitis is initially apparent as posterior lateral swelling between the extensor tendon and lateral collateral ligaments. With swelling of periarticular structures such as bursitis, tenosynovitis or enthesopathy, the contour and position of the swelling alone often suggests which structure is affected. For example, prepatellar bursitis causes a domed swelling immediately in front of the patella whereas the swelling of superficial infrapatellar bursitis is distal to this, immediately in front of the patellar tendon. Both of these are very different in position and appearance 
from a knee effusion. Nodules can occur almost anywhere, but particularly target extensor surfaces with little soft tissue protection, such as the backs of the hands, the elbow, knees and around the Achilles. The main causes of large nodules relevant to arthritis are rheumatoid arthritis and gout. Although deformities may be observed at rest, most joint deformities become more apparent on weight-bearing or usage. You should determine whether a deformity is correctable, usually implying soft tissue factors in causation, or non-correctable, usually capsular restriction or joint damage. Definitions of common deformities include varus, the bone distal to the joint of interest, is angled inwards towards the midline. Valgus. The bone distal to the joint of interest is angled outwards, away from the midline. Fixed flexion. The joint is unable to extend, so is always in some degree of flexion. Hyperextension. Excessive extension. Subluxation. The bones at each side of the joint have slipped relative to each other, but their ends are still in contact and articulate. Dislocation. The bone ends each side of the joint are no longer in contact. Kyphosis. A flexion curvature of the spine. Note that mild kyphosis of the thoracic spine is normal. Lordosis. An extension curvature of the spine. Note that mild lordosis of the lower cervical and lumbar spine is normal. Scoliosis, lateral curvature of the spine. Muscle wasting is a common sign but can be difficult to detect, particularly in the elderly. Joint disease can cause weakness and wasting of all the muscles that act over the joint to result in regional wasting, whereas localised wasting is more characteristic of a mechanical, tendon, muscle or peripheral nerve or root problem. Inspect movement of the whole person and at individual regions. Musculoskeletal movement should be smooth, symmetrical, pain-free and within a normal range for the patient's age and gender. Arthropathy and periarticular lesions may both cause restriction of active movement. Synovitis causes restriction of all tight-packed positions of the joint and eventually potentially all movements, so-called capsular pattern of restriction. In contrast, tenosynovitis and periarticular lesions usually affect just one plane of movement. The pattern of pain during movement is of diagnostic significance. Pain absent or minimal in the mid-range, but increasing towards the extremes of movement, is stress pain. Universal stress pain in most or all directions of the joint is the most sensitive sign of synovitis. The following aspects may be determined by palpation. Precise localization of tenderness is perhaps the most useful sign for determining the cause of the patient's problem. Joint line or capsular tenderness is localized to the joint boundary and signifies capsular or joint disease if present around the whole margin. Localized joint line tenderness suggests more localized intracapsular pathology. For example, anterior medial tibiofemoral compartment tenderness with a medial meniscal injury. Tenderness produced by palpating away from the joint line, over the periosteum of bone, a tendon, tendon sheath, bursa, enthesis or muscle, clearly points to abnormality in the tender structure. Increased warmth is one of the cardinal signs of inflammation. The back of the hand is a sensitive thermometer for comparing skin temperature above, over and below an inflamed structure. 
Abnormal coolness usually reflects reduced regional flow, for example from Raynaud's or alga dystrophy. Deformable, soft swelling may be soft tissue and or fluid. For small fluid volumes in a confined cavity, a bulge sign may be produced. For example, at the knee, fluid can be shifted from the medial dimple to the lateral aspect of the patella and back again. Larger volumes produce a balloon sign or fluctuance, where pressure over one point causes ballooning at other parts of the swelling. This is the most specific sign for increased fluid in a joint or a bursa. Other swellings do not deform on pressure and may be firm or hard, for example osteophyte, enthesophyte or compacted urate crystals in a tophus. It is helpful to determine whether any soft tissue or firm swelling is mobile or fixed to adjacent structures such as skin, tendon or underlying periosteum. A number of important aspects may be determined by palpation during movement. Crepitus is palpable crunching present through most of the movement of the involved structure. Fine crepitus or crackling is very localised and may be heard using a stethoscope as a rasping, rustling noise. It mainly results from tenosynovitis or bursitis. More easily felt is coarse crepitus, a rough, crunching, grating sensation, often felt over a wide area and sometimes heard even without a stethoscope. This is a sign of cartilage or bone damage. Most other musculoskeletal noises are of no clinical significance, although they may be presenting symptoms. These include ligamentous snaps, usually single, loud and painless. These are common around the upper femur as clicking hips, the wrist and knee. Cracking by joint distraction. This is most common at finger joints and is caused by production of an intra-articular gas bubble. And reproducible painless clonking noises at irregular surfaces, for example the scapula moving over the ribs. These noises do not reflect any pathology and require reassurance only. Localised joint instability may result from pathology of the ligaments or loss of cartilage. Traumatic rupture of a ligament is a very common cause. Stability is determined by holding the bones either side of the joint and demonstrating excessive movement with sideways stressing of the joint. There are different stress tests for different joints. Comparison with the other side is often helpful. If the patient has restriction and or pain on active movement, it is very useful to compare findings when the same movements are undertaken passively by the examiner. If pain or restriction result from intracapsular synovitis or joint damage, then findings during active and passive movement are very similar because the capsule will be placed under tension whether the patient's or the examiner's muscles are used. However, when there is a lesion outside the joint, there will be more movement with less pain when the examiner undertakes the movement because the patient's muscles, tendon or emphasis are not being placed under such tension as when the patient leads the movement. If you wish to exclude a joint problem, you can go straight for passive movement of a tight pack position, for example internal rotation of the hip in flexion. If this is pain-free and normal in range, this excludes joint disease in most situations. Ranges of movement are age, sex and race dependent. Attempts to measure degrees of movement by a variety of instruments are inaccurate, have poor reproducibility and are not recommended for routine purposes. Again, comparison of the two sides may help identify an abnormality. However, it is clearly relevant to document the range of movement of a joint in some situations, for example before and after a surgical intervention. This is a useful method for demonstrating a periarticular lesion. 
The patient pushes against the examiner's restraining hand to contract the muscle of interest, but without being allowed to move the adjacent joint. If this isometric contraction produces the patient's pain and the joint has not moved, it must have arisen from the muscle, tendon or tendon insertion that has been tightened and stressed. For example, resisted initiation of glenohumeral abduction produces upper arm pain with supraspinatus muscle or superior cuff lesions. Resisted wrist extension reproduces lateral epicondyle pain in enthesopathy of tennis elbow. Passively stretching a strained ligament or tendon will often reproduce the patient's pain. If passive stretch of abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis reproduces pain, this indicates inflammation of the shared tendon sheath, commonly known as de Quervin's tenosynovitis. Applying a valgus stress to the knee when unlocked in mild flexion stresses the medial collateral ligament. This will cause pain in the inferior insertion of the ligament in the upper medial tibia if the patient has medial collateral ligament enthesopathy. To assess common weakness, for example in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, it is more appropriate to screen for movements that relate to daily activities, such as grip strength and fine precision grip of the hand, and to directly observe daily activities, such as getting up and down from a chair and walking. Following an adequate history and examination, a number of differences will be apparent to permit distinction between a joint problem, including the capsule, and an extracapsular periarticular problem. For example, on examination, tenderness will be over the joint line with a joint problem, such as arthritis, but away from the joint line with a periarticular lesion. Active and passive range of motion and pain will be similar if it is joint disease, but discordant with periarticular lesions. Stress pain will be in all planes of movement in joint disease, but usually only in a single plane with periarticular disease. Swelling will expand the capsule outline with joint disease, but will be more localised and related to the affected structure if periarticular. All muscles acting over a joint may be wasted with joint disease, but only one or a few muscles will be wasted with a periarticular lesion. Any increased warmth will be over the joint with joint disease, but localised over a periarticular lesion. Coarse crepitus is a sign of joint damage, but fine crepitus usually accompanies a periarticular lesion. If the patient has a joint problem, the following differences should allow differentiation between an inflamed joint or a damaged joint, most commonly osteoarthritis. Prolonged early morning and inactivity stiffness imply inflammation. Increased warmth clearly goes with inflammation, and stress pain is one of the most sensitive signs of inflammation. Capsular swelling and effusion go with inflammation, whereas coarse crepitus, any malalignment and instability result from structural damage. Sometimes there may be a mixture of joint damage and inflammation. Two common conditions that associate with musculoskeletal complaints need to be specifically sought, otherwise they will not be detected. These are generalised hypermobility and fibromyalgia. There is a range of normal joint mobility which is age, gender and race dependent. The term generalised hypermobility describes the 10% of adults at the most mobile end of this range. These people are predisposed to certain locomotor problems such as enthesopathy, arthralgia and recurrent dislocation. Within this population there are also a small number of individuals with disease-related hypermobilities such as Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and acromegaly. Hypermobility can be detected using a modified Baton score. This gives one point for each of the following movements. 
extending the little finger more than 90 degrees, one point each side, bringing the thumb back parallel to or touching the forearm, one point each, extending the elbow more than 10 degrees, one point each, extending the knee more than 10 degrees, one point each, and touching the floor with the flat of the hands with legs straight, one point. This gives a maximum score of nine. If an adult scores six or more, they are classified as hypermobile. Fibromyalgia is a common syndrome that is characterised by multiple regional pain, marked fatigability, non-restorative sleep, generalised lowered pain threshold. It commonly associates with irritable bowel, irritable bladder, tension headache, distress and low mood. The widespread hyperalgesia can be detected by applying pressure just sufficient to blanch the fingernail in typical tender sites. The following are the most commonly used. The supraspinatus belly, above the medial border of the scapular spine on each side. Rolling a skin fold over the midpoint of the upper trapezius on each side. The second anterior costochondral junctions on each side. The lateral epicondyle site at each elbow, approximately 2 cm distal to the epicondyle, over the annular ligament and radial head. The insertion of the suboccipital muscles on each side. The lower cervical C5 to C7 interspinous ligaments the lower lumbar interspinous ligaments, the mid-gluteal regions in the upper outer quadrant of the buttock, the greater trochanter posterior to the trochanter prominence and the fat pad above the medial joint line of each knee. These sites are often tender to palpation in a normal person, but in fibromyalgia the patient typically gives a wince withdrawal response to sites in all four quadrants of the body. General examination is required for all patients presenting with musculoskeletal symptoms. This may detect abnormality in other systems relevant to the diagnosis as well as important comorbidity. Equally, a screening musculoskeletal examination should be undertaken as part of the general medical assessment in view of the high prevalence of musculoskeletal conditions and their impact on the patient. The GALS is a suitable screening tool for this purpose and is available as an accompanying video. A detailed inquiry is an essential part of patient assessment. It gives key information concerning the nature of the patient's symptoms and the impact of the condition on the individual's daily life. Importantly, it also restricts the differential diagnosis to just one or a very few possibilities and is crucial in directing the focus of the examination. Application of simple principles of examination usually enable a firm clinical diagnosis to be made and for many prevalent conditions clinical assessment alone is sufficient for diagnosis and development of an individualized management plan. Other chapters in this series will apply these principles to each region and illustrate the detailed examination techniques that comprise the basic repertoire of musculoskeletal assessment.